it's like sharing a part of your soul and it's about connecting with people and sharing and showing them love and that's the language that you can that i use is food this is the deep in the weeds podcast i'm anthony huckstep we live in a global society but the pandemic has closed borders worldwide it's cut off that sense of connection that ability to travel on a whim and heightened concerns about the sort of existence we'll have moving forward in one way or another, most people in Australia have come from somewhere else. Whether first, second or third generation, we all have lineage to countries all over the world. But with cases still escalating overseas, what impact does that have on Australians with family abroad? Monica Lupi is the owner of Lulu's. Monica, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. You have an incredible background of Italy, American, Australian. It's very rich and yep. your food um, shows that. How are you feeling at the moment with what's going on in the world, particularly in America, in the middle of this election? Oh, terrified. <laughs> um, yeah, um, it's, it's, it's pretty scary. Um, the election itself, I have to say, you know, America is one of those countries that... Um, it's not just about America itself, but it affects the whole world. So um, it's, 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 I'm optimistic that, um, you know, obviously Joe Biden, um, I, I read something really interesting that said, um, you know, Donald Trump is not the disease, he's the symptom. And um, Joe Biden is not the cure, but he's a tourniquet. Um, so I really like that. I think it's, you know, I can't say I'm super enthusiastic about Joe Biden, but I am very happy to hear a different tone and which will reverberate across the world, I think, um, if things go how they should. <laughs> Do you have concerns about how close it seems to be at the moment? We still don't have a result and it is quite close. Yes, I'm concerned. I'm less concerned than I was last night. Obviously, until all is said and done, we can't trust anything that um, Trump does. You know, he might decide to not accept the results. And, you know, he's famous in his whole career for having... Um, sued to exhaustion that's the way he gets things done is just keep suing until you know it's so we can't sit on even the result we're seeing now until it's um until he's gone I think we'll be holding our breath <laughs> well 2020 is a year that none of us are going to forget very easily um, given what's happening right now but the pandemic has obviously had a monumental impact on everyone around the globe you, you made a name for yourself with doing incredible pop-ups all over Sydney, um, whether it was tamales or Italian with Lulu's. What sort of impact has this time had on what you do? Well, you know, I, you have to be so careful. And, you know, the main thing that I've had as far as my pop-ups, the main thing that I've um, had in my mind is is safety and making sure people feel safe. And, um, you know, at first, obviously, it was very clear that everything would stop. But unlike restaurants um, that are um, operating and they have, you know, it's it's very, very hard for them. And I wouldn't want to be somebody that owns a restaurant right now. I can't even um, I can't even imagine. So on one side, I'm lucky because I can just pull back and say, well, I'm not going to do anything for a while. Um, on the other side, I feel the guidance for kind of one off events is not clear, really. And so I've just decided to take a break from it because, like, luckily I can take a break from from putting myself in that situation that restaurants don't have that luxury. They're kind of like, they have to push forward or else they're not going to survive. Um, but for myself, I've kind of taken a break because I just feel, I don't know if I can guarantee people's safety in my situation. I don't know if I can make, you know, obviously it's such a small, small percentage of chance that you would kept have that happen. But I'm not the kind of person that likes to even have zero, 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 zero point one percent chance. So for me, it's kind of something that um, I think everybody has to deal with individually. I think everybody has to do what they feel is right. I think in a situation like this, um, 
because of what we all go through personally, emotionally, financially, you know, we're all swimming through, you know, a new sea <laughs> of uncertainty and fear and doubt, and we all have our own things. So for me, it's just been kind of like until I feel it's right, until I can guarantee um, that what I'm going to do is going to just have good feelings around it, then I'm going to take a pause with it. That's that's where I'm at right now. Something you have done during this time is release some products that people can buy, uh, buy in retail. And one of them is like Lulu's Remedy, that incredible chili oil that you do. Can you tell us about this sort of pivot that you did and the products that you put out there and what the response has been? Well, you've got me smiling now, Huck, <laughs> because it's just been such a strange and wonderful thing. And, um, you know, I think one of the, if we can look at a bright spot in this very difficult and dark time, and we always need to, without obviously um, ignoring the difficulties that so many people have around the world and, and here as well. But um, if we don't look at bright spots, I think, you know, it's going to be even more difficult. And, I've just noticed, noted so many other business, so many, the way that, you know, and we can go talk about this more, I think, as a follow-up, but um, the way that small businesses have banded together and have pivoted has just been so amazing. And I have been so lucky. Um, really, the whole chili oil uh, project came out of uh, me over ordering chilies um, <laughs> randomly. <laughs> I I over I ordered a kilo instead of a hundred gram bag by mistake of a few different types of chilies, uh, Mexican chilies that I use in cooking. And I said, well, you know, during lockdown, I just and I went, well, maybe I'll make some chili oil. And I live on the um, on the same street as Sample Coffee in St. Peter's. So I go in there every day, and the owners are so nice. And I said, listen, you know, I make this chili oil, maybe you know, you guys have a little grocery store set up now because of COVID, like maybe you could take a few jars. Uh, and they were just like, oh yeah, we haven't tasted it, but sure, you know, and it was kind of like, whatever. And <laughs> just random. And um, yeah, and uh, I just dropped it off to them. And then one of the um, people that works there is married to someone that writes in food and like really loved it and then you know gourmet traveler randomly wrote to me and was like hey we want to try your oil we're doing a thing on chili oils and they loved it and it, you know it's just like the most amazing thing I mean now I feel so happy and I'm actually surviving on making it you know and um it's um you know plus job keeper thank you job keeper but um you know, it's, I'm doing well with it. And I'm able, it, it's almost as if through COVID, I found something um, that I just love to do that people really enjoy that seems to be understood and received well. And um, yeah, it's almost like <laughs> you push so hard for so many different things, and they're so hard. And then all of a sudden, this thing comes along, and it's easy. And you're going, oh, why, what the heck did I just, why did I struggle for so many years and lose all sorts of money and like make it so hard on myself when really like the simplest thing, sometimes they just happen and it feels like spontaneous and amazing, you know? So, um, I'm now selling to like, you know, about 10 different or 12 different places, I think online. And it's been shipped across Australia and it's still just me which is the funnest thing because people like, you know, on Instagram will be like, oh, yeah, you're really doing well. And I'm like, yeah, but it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes use the plural on Instagram to make it look like we're some sort of real company, but it's actually <laughs> just me. <laughs> well, I don't want to give away your secrets or anything, but it is an extraordinary chili oil. Is What are the... What, what makes a good chili oil? Um, I think for me, it's um, it's versatile. And like, I hope I don't sound like I'm showing off, but what I've really got, I mean, it's a fluke. Like, it's a complete fluke. So I can say it's good because I have, I feel like I'm not responsible for making it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like some other weird thing that happened. Um, so I think the fact that it's versatile, like it does go with a lot of different cuisines people like. Um, and then... Um, just the different types of chili. So I use four different types of chili in it. And like what's great about chilies, I think, is not all of them bring heat so much, but like some of them bring more depth of flavor or like a fruitiness or like an umami. Um, and so the mix of the chilies, I think, is really what makes it tasty more than just hot. 
Um, and then lots of garlic and lots of salt, <laughs> which is my Italian side. <laughs> you made a, a name for yourself making tamales and all sorts of things across Sydney, but why tamales? Could you tell us, you know, where that started and, and what makes a great tamale? Yeah, and and um, I hope I don't sound like I go off topic on every question you ask me, <laughs> but um, um, I didn't see them around, um, and I think they're just a great food because they're portable, and, you know, th- for those of you who don't know what it is, um, it's like a steamed um, parcel, like you would have, uh, I guess, uh, Mexican version of what could be a dumpling, I guess, in a certain way, or, um, you know... Um, and inside there's a corn and meat or vegetable. And then I used to top it with all sorts of pickles and things like that. Um, and I just thought it was a really good food to be portable and that can, you know, and it's pretty durable, like it maintains its, um, its flavor through time. And when you're cooking for in a commercial kitchen or for, you know, a pop-up or, you know, you have to sell across a day, you don't want something that is going to take a really long time to get ready at the moment. You need something that can, can sit there sort of ready and still be good when, when it's ready to serve. So it had a lot of qualities that I felt would work really well and it's so tasty and a good drinking food. Um, but, um, but yeah, I switched over to Italian food um, just because as I was going on and on um, doing the tamales, I felt, um, you know, we've talked a lot about cultural appropriation lately it's a big topic in food and um you know again everybody has that line of what they feel comfortable cooking and I'm not saying I can't make tamales but I I just slowly started feeling like more and more like it wasn't me Uh, I don't know if that makes sense but I just thinking and taking in what people were talking about online and I just thought a lot of that stuff kind of started resonating with me. And as I became kind of more and more, not that I was super known, but like as I became more and more known as that tamale person and started teaching classes on how to make them and things like that, I just started like little little flags started going off um, inside my mind. And I just started feeling like if I'm really going to be doing something that maybe I become a tiny bit more known for and that I'm sharing with people I felt like I needed to move back to my actual identity my childhood the things I really grew up eating even though I I did eat you know a lot of Mexican food when I lived in California growing up there I just there's something that started feeling a bit off for me um and I just go yeah well I don't want to be doing this anymore and that's kind of why I stopped doing it um they're tasty they're good but I think everybody now is questioning what it means to cook a certain cuisine, what it means to cook and how good is it when you cook from your soul that really food is yours. Um, and I just felt like I needed to do that. So um, hope that's not too off topic for your tamale question, but it's something I really care about um, right now and I wanted to talk about. So, yeah. Well, you headed down the Italian path. Can you tell us about your upbringing and and what food meant in that environment? Oh, everything, Huck. Food means everything, and it has meant everything um, for us. Um, You know, growing up, it was such a huge thing. I mean, I'm lucky in that um, my whole family really loves food. Um, My mom was an incredible cook, um, and... I was always into cooking like I was this really weird kid like I was incredibly weird (laughs) and like I would come home from school at like age 10 and like make cheese like and this is before the internet like I don't know how in my mind I figured out how I thought I could make cheese but um, I'm not sure I'd want to eat that cheese right now but you know I was very very into it just from a young age and there was so many good memories and um, you know, of just the dishes that I grew up eating and yeah, it's, it's so important and, and it carries through till today and food is memory. Like food is about that sensory memory that we hold that's beyond what we can explain rationally or, you know, with our minds. Like when you taste something and it just takes you back, um, that is so important to me. So important. Mm. What are some of the dishes that do that for you that take you back to that? time of growing up um some of them are really 
probably <laughs> trashier. Um, like my my um, because yeah, like weird little things. Like there's this um, when when we were like my in the summer, my mom would make this salad, which was very very simple and rustic, which was just sliced up onions, um, bean white beans, and this stuff called um, cimental or manzotin, which is this um, tinned Italian beef. It's like a corned beef brisket, but with jelly around it. Um, and it sounds pretty gross probably to anyone who's not Italian, but it's like this, I guess it's our version of Spam. So that's a very like childhood memory dish for me. Um, but then lots of um, vegetables and salads and fresh um, fresh things across the table every time we ate. And um, I think that's like a, a really important thing. Another memory I, I hold very close is my dad um, after dinner. We never ate sweets. We weren't really like a dessert family. But after dinner, he would have this um, glass of um, like the green onions. You know, I don't know what you guys call them here. Is it shall shallots here? The ones, the long green onions, spring onions? He would have this like cleaned glass of um, spring onions and a hunk of um, parmigiano reggiano on the table. And that was his like dessert and with a cigarette. So you can imagine the breath that was happening there. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, but you know, I have so many, I'm, I'm so grateful to my mom because um, we ate very seasonally, very much in a healthy way, and lots of different vegetable dishes and salads and things like that. And, and that continues to be my taste today. So I'm very grateful. I know you had a pop up almost right on at the time that the pandemic landed, it was just weeks before doing Italian, what, what sort of food were you cooking then? Um, yeah, so always homemade pastas. Um, definitely fresh pasta is my thing. Um, and um, what I like to do is talk to my producers that I work with, the people I source my produce from, see what's good and, and go on that. So it, um, my produ favorite producer for vegetables is the Veggie Box, Shane. He's an amazing guy. Um, he's so passionate and real and he cares. And, um, you know, that's a huge part of what, I care about in food is connecting with people who feel the same way, who are not about, um, you know, making millions or becoming some hotshot, like famous, you know, person, but really do it for the, for the love of the act of cooking and the love of the act of feeding people. Um, so I always connect with him and he tells me what's good and what's not good. And um, so I do a few vegetable dishes um, always, like a cooked one and a, a raw one. So I remember very clearly that there was zucchini flowers at the time um, with the baby zucchinis. So I, I made a salad with those and some uh, potatoes and fresh tomatoes. There was very good tomatoes back then, radishes, things like that. So uh, to me, it's about making a few really nice vegetable dishes simply dressed um, and I'm t terrible at dessert. So, uh, um, I did serve uh, gelato, uh, for dessert. Um, very much into Mapo gelato. He's another one. He's another one of those people, Mapo in Newtown. If you haven't gone, you have to go. He's a wonderful human being. He cares about the same things, um, that I care about, which is, you know, being sustainable, being honest, being transparent in your food and sharing love with your food. And, um, he makes an amazing vegan, gelato that just tastes incredible um so that was good because i love to be able to serve vegans um that's definitely something i care about even though i eat meat um yeah so it was fun <laughs> it was really fun you weren't always in the food industry you actually left the corporate world to head into food can you tell us about that period of time and why you made that shift sure um so i actually worked in um, restaurants in my 20s um just as like a line cook and like a sandwich cook, things like that, very basic stuff. I loved it. Uh, in my mind, I just didn't think, I don't know if it was because, um, probably because I was still finding who I was and emotionally, like just had a lot of like, you know, issues growing up, mental health issues, things like that. I just didn't have the confidence to say like, this is what I want to do. So I went into, I worked in nonprofit corporate, not, not horrible, evil corporate, but nonprofit corporate um, for many years. Um, and um, when I, my mom passed away in 2010. Um, and I think if there's anything that 
losing a parent does it's it reminds you how short life is or i hope that in the horribleness of losing a parent too young one of the things you get out of it is it's a blessing to see oh, damn that person if they could have lived one more day they probably would have you know they would have paid to live one more day so you realize that you have to do what you love that's it it gives you the courage <laughs> um so when i moved moved to Australia that one of the main things I did that year when she passed away was decide to leave Italy and move to Australia um and um in my mind I said well this is it I'm gonna do food it's what I want um and so basically I had to wait four more years after I did that made that decision because I had to get sponsored be able to stay in Australia get my permanent residency and and then be able to resign so I did four more years of of that um, which was really a struggle because I was um, commuting back and forth to WA um, and working from home and then working one week a month in WA. So it was tough. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so then I got very lucky because through my nonprofit work, I got connected to Oz Harvest. And they, at the time, before COVID, did a program called Cooking for a Cause. And I met Ronnie and... Um, she was like, well, what do you want to do? And I said, cook. <laughs> and so I got very lucky in that the Ronnie and, and then the head chef, Trav, um, you know, I cooked, I cooked a big lunch for the whole team at the office there one day. I think that was my baptism by fire. Um, and so they could tell that I could sort of cook um, for a big number of people and that I kind of knew what I was doing a little bit. Um, and then they gave me a chance and they said, come on and, you know, and then I became a teacher there slowly. Um, and then that gave me the confidence to go, okay. <laughs> so if it wasn't for them, that was my foray into, um, going back into the kitchen. Yeah. You've been involved with Oz, Oz Harvest ever since. What's, what's it been like this year working with Oz Harvest and seeing the impact of the pandemic on different people? Oh God, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's so hard. Like you really see the need for, for a place like Oz Harvest through this. Um, so many people struggling to get food. Um, they've really pivoted and filled the need. Um, you know, obviously our cooking classes stopped, but we basically transitioned into becoming like a full-time production kitchen for um, feeding people in need. Um, so we went from teaching classes to making, you know, I think we have over, I think I'll say they, because I've, you know, I've been there sporadically. I haven't been, I'm not a full-time person there, so I don't want to take the credit, but they've made, I think over a hundred thousand meals. Um, and, um, you know, it's just the group there is so wonderful. I can't say enough about the corporate culture there, the support, the understanding, you know, everybody that's gone through this past year has struggled and emotionally, mentally, mental health. I can't say that, you know, I can't believe anyone would say that they're doing just great. You know, every, all of us have been living in fear and uncertainty. So the fact that, you know, an organization like that is just incredibly supportive of the people that work for them. And it's just been great to see how, um, you know, Oz Harvest has been able to go straight from one way of helping people to another, you know, anything from making hampers to making sure people are fed to taking the food truck out in community and, um, yeah, and making sure we all feel very safe being there um, throughout even the hardest bits. So, uh, yeah, it's been amazing to see the resilience and very difficult to see the need um, that's that's out there right now as well. Mm. You have friends and family in Italy. What's what's it been like being so far from them, and and what's what impact has the pandemic had on on them? Oh God, it's it's really hard. I mean, I'm going to get emotional, <laughs> but um, you just the the missing the missing them is 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 incredible. Like the the missing the people that um that you just think are always going to be there. It's very very hard. Um, the sense of home. Um. Obviously, Australia is my home, but, um, you know, we have no idea. We're so incredibly lucky here in Australia, you know, and we're very lucky in how 
as much as I have a lot to criticize about this government, like a lot, I still think, you know, the way that it's been handled has been relatively good with, you know, everything that's gone. We've been kept safe. And, um, you know, the idea that, you know, in Italy now there's, you know, more than 10,000 cases a day. And I talked to my friends and they're still living their lives going out you know, um, they're still going out and, and having to go to work and living their lives. You know, <laughs> when we think here, you know, when it was at 20 cases in New South Wales a day, we were like, oh, are we going to another lockdown? <laughs> you know, so the amount of trauma that has gone on there, I just, you know, it's hard. And I think it makes probably makes me a bit more careful here because I'm feeling in a way, and you know, I guess through the empathy that you have with the people you care about, um, you're feeling the fear that they're feeling as well. So I think probably it's made me be much more cautious here, much more careful, much more worried, um, because you carry the worry of the people you care about as well. And, um, you know, they're going into a winter now. I just, you know, I just don't know. Uh, and the Italian economy is, is so bad already. Um, very scared for them. Yeah. And in the U.S. as well. And, um, you know, the U.S., I have a lot of friends there. I lived there for a long time. <sighs> it's so bad. You know, all we can, all I can keep feeling is gratitude for being here as at the same time of wishing you could travel, you know, wishing you could, you know, I'm not above those petty little things that seem so small when you, when you think about how other people are suffering. I'm not above saying, you know, I wish I could go somewhere or, you know, have fun or whatever, but, um, you know, they're really, really doing it tough. So we're incredibly lucky. We are. Mm. How have you felt during this time? Has, has the events of this year changed you? Oh, for sure. You know, I think if somebody says that it hasn't, um, changed them, then <laughs> they're either a psychopath or lying. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, you know, on one side, I think we're all, you know, we all are going to realize how it's affected us after it's over, whenever that is, because this is a massive trauma the whole world has gone through. Um, and it affects every single person as, as an individual differently, you know, it will trigger, um, in each of us different fears, different, um, different reactions, um, you know, different ways of seeing the world that, you know, I don't think we could possibly even, talk about now that we're still in the middle of it. Um, but I think if we want to be hopeful, I think what's been amazing is at least here in Australia, again, how these, you know, community has come together, how people have helped each other, how, um, you know, leaving myself aside, I've seen so many amazing little small businesses pop up and people doing things for each other. It's almost like in this massive globalized world, we've had to think small again. And I think it's just such a wonderful thing, like to come back to community and neighborhood and, you know, um, the little corner grocery shop that we thought had disappeared came back and making things at home has come back and feeding each other a hot meal and making, you know, another great, um, person is, um, do you know, megafauna food, uh, like she's this amazing chef who got trapped in Australia. She was living in New York and she ended up getting trapped here and making these amazing meals from her home, um, celebrating all these different cultures. So if one thing COVID has also given me hope in humanity and I'll carry that and I'll, and I can, and we can see how important it is for little tiny small businesses to make things and to bring love and hope to people. Um, and at the end of the day, big companies like Qantas and Woolies can't do much for us, but like the corner store, you know, that's barely making it themselves helping out by putting small products on their shelves is what has actually taken us through this. Um, it's proof, right? That what we need is to hold on to each other and, and, and for small, that, that the small guy, the little guy is really what's going to carry us through. Like if the world is going to end, <laughs> like we're going to survive by, you know, going back to our little tribes and our little, um, families and, and holding on to each other like that, you know, um, we don't need the big guys. 
It's it's been a tough year, but you've had some unexpected successes with the with the chili oil. What what's the future for Lulu's? How do you see the next year playing out? Um, well, I'm definitely continuing to make it. Um, you know, one thing obviously, um, I think one thing that we have to question is why we do things. Um, and for myself, um, through like all the pop ups and all the different you know paths I've taken, I think. And through COVID, I think the thing is you have to ask yourself why you do what you do. And I'm sure you've done that too, Huck. And I think everyone's had to question why they do it, the things they do and what's important. And so for me, I realize it's about maintaining a balance. Um, I'm not about making Lulu's like this big thing that like, you know, oh, I want to grow as much as I can or like hire a bunch of people and just make like shit loads of oil and like go crazy and try to get into the IGA or whatever, which, you know, like tip of the hat to whoever can do that but it's not who I am um so for me it will always be as much as I can handle and manage maintaining a balance of my life and and being able to survive financially you know just on that line without having to be you know making that much money um and always keeping it in I always want to just work with people that I actually know who they are know who the person is that runs that company and like that we have respect and we like each other. So that's what I want to continue doing. So every single person that I sell to um, that retails my oil is somebody that I know who I'm dealing with. I know the person and I like them um, and that they make me happy and they bring something to my life and that I can continue to do this and maintain a balance and not make it be something where I'm compromising my happiness or anything about what I do to make it to the next step or be bigger. Um, that's where I want to be. I don't want to go anywhere. I just want to be happy. And like, if I, if people ask me and I don't have it and I've run out that week, then that's fine, you know, and and that's where I want to (laughs) be. Yeah. You're renowned for your generosity and if anything overfeeding people and being <laughs> so generous with your hospitality how do, how does cooking for people make you feel oh it's like sharing a part of your soul and your heart i know that sounds so corny but i don't care cuz it's the end of times we must be corny <laughs> we can <laughs> i'm like the least cool person on the planet i'm just like i'm earnest i'm a dork and i'm truthful like that's all like um it just makes me incredibly happy and it's probably made me a terrible businesswoman um but that's okay um it's about connecting with people and sharing and showing them love and that's the language that you can that I use is food um so for me that's um again it's made me not a great business person um but you know for a long time I built I kind of beat myself up about not being able to achieve and our society is really like about becoming you know having a name and having a reputation and I think there's a lot of arrogance um, in the food world about, you know, like there's a, it's weird. It's almost cool to be like, fuck you. We're just assholes and we just do this. I'm sorry. Would I just swear on this podcast? (laughs) Oh, sorry. Beep, beep. Um, um, Come on. There's swearing in the kitchen. There's gotta be swearing on a podcast. I like a little disclaimer at the beginning of this podcast. Monica swears. Um, But you know, there's a lot of this kind of like F you attitude around and, um, and it's very dog eat dog and it's very competitive in certain circles. And, and uh, for me, I just, um, you know, I beat myself about up about how emotional I was about food and how much I cared and how much it got to me and all this stuff. And I've just kind of gone, screw it. This is, this is what I am. And it really makes me happy. And feeding people makes me happy. Making a lot of money doesn't necessarily make me happy. Um, besides being on this podcast, having everybody, you know, know who I am doesn't really make me happy. Um, (laughs) um, so, you know, again you you ask what's important and like yeah food is what makes me happy feeding people makes me happy sharing with people it's more it's more about sharing um yeah so well as the recipient of your amazing hospitality i can say it's food that i'd eat every single day it's extraordinary what you do and we've loved having you on deep in the weeds today 
please keep in touch and we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Huck. And you're uh, thank you for doing this podcast. You're such a kind and generous person and your voice has been so important during all this. So I'm so grateful. Um, thank you so much. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.